and gentlemen to Waterstones and Newton Mearns and of course the Primavera Cafe, the uh, fantastic cafe here in Newton Mearns as well. My name is Russell McLean. Um, you may recognize me ex of Waterstones. Um, I'm also a crime writer critic and occasional host for these events. But tonight, um, it's not about me, which is good for you. It really is. It's about one of the best-selling UK crime authors um, of the moment. Her books have been bestsellers since the beginning of her career, and she is, according to the um, front of most of her books, the woman who tells it like it is, renowned for the grit and realism of her work. Her books are the most borrowed in UK prisons, according to one statistic I read. Um, I also read they're the most shoplifted, but I'm sure that's not going to happen tonight. <laughs> um, the latest book is The Good Life, which... Uh, um, you will see piled there on the table. Um, tells the story of Jenny, a woman who falls in love with gangster Kane Moran. Kane sentenced years inside, and when everything looks good, um, and the book looks at the price they both pay for having lived the good life. So it's a good title. It's a belter of a book. It really is. She is a belter of an author. She is fantastic. She is the incredible, ladies and gentlemen, Martina Cole. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just going to say that's the first woo I've heard for an author from <laughs> <laughs> so this is, we're off to a good, please feel free to woo more good whenever start, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, obviously this is your new book, The Good Life, and yeah. I think it makes sense to start talking about it. And one of the things I admire about your books is that you balance all that criminality with a kind of commentary on family life and ordinary people as well. And is it important to you in your books to get that balance? But I think that's the secret of the books, actually. Can you all hear me? Because I've got a really deep voice. When, when I get phone calls, they, ask, they call me Mr. Cole. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, For me, I think the secret of the books is that I have the women who are married to these men and women who are caught up in this life. And I think that's pretty much why people like them so much. Mm -hmm. I, I deal with the mums, the wives, the girlfriends, the sisters the grandmothers who's, you know, whose children are, are caught up in this life or whose family are caught up in this life. Is that better? Yeah. Sorry, I, yeah, I, th I think they again. can hear us in Glasgow town centre now, can't <laughs> They're all trying to watch EastEnders going, what's that noise? <laughs> But, yeah, sorry, I, was, I, I just had to change that there. But, I mean, this is the thing, because Jenny herself in this book, she's not what you call a bad girl, but no. she's attracted to bad lads, I think, with Kane. She meets Kane Moran, and Kane's married, but she doesn't know that, and she sort of falls madly in love him. She's only just 16, nearly 17. Kane is a, a bit older than her. He's married to a lady named Caroline, who's a raving lunatic. And he actually falls in love with her, and they, they sort of have an affair. Um, and I don't want to tell you too much because I don't want to give the story away, but eventually Kane gets 25 years in prison and the, do the story really deals with all that happened for him to go away for that long, which was a, a terrible thing, he'd done a terrible thing, and how they kept their relationship together and what happened while she was on the out and he was on the in. And it's, it's incredible that you balance it. I mean, I do have to ask, because the, the way you portray the relationship between Jenny and Kane is fantastic. Yeah. Do you have a thing for bad lads yourself? My first boyfriend was a bank robber <laughs> when I was 14 and I, was, I remember going down the road and he was really, really handsome. He had this great big jag and it was 1973 and he'd been away for a long time and he thought I was one of my sisters who's six years older. We all looked quite alike so I just let him think I was. Because was so, I was so like, I was so, oh my God, he's so handsome, he's got a car. Um, and he took me for a meal, I never forget, he took me for a meal in the, in the East End of London. And he said, oh, have you ever had, you know, Indian food? I was going, oh yes, I ate it all the time, I've never had it in my life. And we went in this restaurant and he ordered for me. I said, oh no, you order for me. And I took one bite and then I drank his pint of beer. And he said to me, yeah, I can see you do this all the time with your Indian food. <laughs> And then he eventually, obviously, found out how old I was. Mm -hmm. and, and he was terrified because he was 27. <laughs> and he was always frightened, I think, that they think he was a paedophile or something. And he picked me up from school and had my games kit on. I don't think that helped either. But I sta I've stayed friends with him up to this day. We are still really, really great friends, yeah. So, mm -hmm. But, I mean, you, you said he was a bank robber. Did he, I mean, obviously Kane sent away in this book. Was he caught or was he...? Oh, yeah, my one was caught a few times. <laughs> That's the exact reason why I'm not married to him now. But, um, no, he was a really, really lovely person. And I think that's what I learned as I grew up over the years where I lived is... Often times, you know, people are portrayed, you know, they're these terrible people. But they're someone's son someone's dad, someone, you know, and oftentimes they're a completely different person to the person, you know, they might come across as. And I think that's what my books are about, is that, you know, 
they do terrible things and they're terrible people. I don't dispute that. But to the people who love them, you know, they're their family. And I, 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 you know, I think that's what people forget. Oftentimes when you send someone to prison, you sentence a whole family. The mums, the nans, the sister, everyone who loves that person because they do love that person. You know, and that's why I do so much in the prisons, with, especially with the younger prisoners, because I do believe that you should get a second chance. Not all of them, but some of them. Some of them. Because uh, the one thing, uh, the other thing in this book is you have, um, when Kane's inside, your portrayal of yeah. prison life is, it's not what I expected, actually, which no. is, because I, I grew up watching Oz on the television, which yeah. probably explains. <laughs> uh, it's, yeah. But, I mean, I think that's interesting. So you, you obviously go, you go into prisons quite a lot, don't you? So you obviously yeah, I've been know. going into prisons, well, for a long time, but on a professional capacity since 1992, you know, sort of for writers' classes. The, in the book, and the, he's in Parkhurst, which has got what's called an SSB unit, which was like a prison within a prison, which was brought in for terrorists and double A grade. They went from A grade to double A grade. Um, and it's like a prison within a prison. And you, they knocked two cells into one, so they could do their own cooking and things. So it's a really heavy long-term prisoner. So I was in Barlini today, and I was talking to one of the POs who's been there for 26 years. And he said, the best thing ever, Tina, is that we, we've got more education and we're doing more things to get, the, especially the younger prisoners, a different way of life, to see a different way of life. One of the biggest shocks for me when I first started doing the prisons was how many young men can't write their name or read. And if you can't fill in a job application, then you can't get a job. You know, so I know that people must go to prison. I've always said people have to go to prison, you know. But for the same token, there's an awful lot of young men in prison and young women in prison who shouldn't really be there. It's one night in a pub. If they hadn't gone out that night and hadn't drunk so much, do you, and especially a lot of the younger women, a lot of the younger women in the prisons are there because of a man. You know, and when men go to prison, they leave their children with the person they trust most in the world, which is the child's mum. Doesn't always happen for the mum. You know, so that's my argument all the time. We're sort of, you know, trying to get education, more education, and send out a better person that went in. I was about to ask that if you believed it was about education that sent them in the first place, actually. But obviously, mm. I think you, you believe that if they had a better education, they would I do. maybe well, be able to. Listen, I was the world's worst. I was expelled from school when I was 13, no, 14 and 15 from two different schools. Sometimes I don't think you really understand when you come from certain areas, you don't understand because you're not brought up with, the, with this thing about get educated or you must go to university or you must go to college. My mum's attitude, I'm 55, my mum's attitude was you go out and get a job. <laughs> you know, get yourself out as quick as you can, go and get a job. Not my brothers though, you know. And I think that again is there's sort of, you know, you talk to a lot of young men in prisons and young women in prisons and you know that if they'd had a different upbringing, that'd be different people. Because, I mean, it interests me, you're, you're talking about this, you've obviously known a lot of people and stuff, and I'm, I'm jumping ahead in all my questions, but I'll come back to the book, because I was reading about you, I've, I've read about your life and things as well, and when you first came into the publishing world, I think you said that you felt it wasn't conducive to people from your background, no. certainly at the time. No, I mean, um, I wrote mm -hmm. Dangerous Lady in 1991, I was... 21 when I wrote it, but so, no, 1981, I was 21, God, just knocked 10 years off my age, <laughs> the way you do, um, and I kept that book for nine, nearly, for about 10 years, nearly 10 years, because I, I had no education, I didn't have any qualifications or anything, mm -hmm. so I didn't think that I was, valid, you know, viable to go and have a book published. Now, obviously, I, whenever I do writers' conferences or prisons or anything, I say, you know, all people are interested in is a story. If you can write an original story that no one else has written and you've got an original take on it, they will buy it. They don't know if, when you said if you're a rocket scientist or like me living in a cat's house. They don't know that. All they know is this is a great story. But is it true, because I was reading an interview with you in Essex Life recently, and I didn't know this before, you, you printed up your own books and gave them to the neighbours before you got published? No, is I didn't that? print them. Oh, right. I lived in a block of flats in, a pla in Tilby, in a pla it was a really rough area where I lived. And one of my neighbours who lived on top floor was a Mills and Boom fanatic. 
So she used to give me 10 cigarettes to write her book. And, and her son used to steal the books from school, you know, the, the exercise books. And I'd sit there all night writing these really beautiful stories where they kissed on the swing at the end. And, but I never really realised at the time that that was so good for me because it, it made me sit and apply myself and write. And the more you write or the more you do something, the better you get at it. Well, that's hopefully. I now have to ask, because you, you've written the romance books, you know, and, you know, and A, are we going to ever see any, but also no. what... <laughs> I think it'd be lovely, given the writing here. But what, 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 turned you to, what turned you to crime, then, from, from that? If you started off writing that and was getting good response, what made you then go, I want to write about... I think you write about what you know, and I grew up in, on the peripheries of that world. Mm. And you, you have to write about what you know. And I think anyone who comes from a huge big council estate anywhere in the country will always have a, you know, a knowledge of crime. Mm. Um, and so I think that's where it comes from, really. Yeah. So but I, I, love it. I love the fact that I don't write from the point of view of the police. I write from the point of view of the criminal. And that's far more exciting for me than to have the same policeman all the time. Mm. Because I was going to ask if publishers have ever kind of pressured you into trying to do, because the procedural is dominant and you're a unique voice, I think, in crime mm. and that you are writing from that point of view of the criminal. Was there at any point, ever, any pressure to try and create an Inspector Never. Rebus or a... You know, Never, horse? no, I mean, Ian, I mean, Ian Rankin, he's a god. But I've got to say, I have had a one detective, Kate Burroughs, I've done a few books with her, but I do prefer to write from the point of view of the criminal. I think the criminals are far more interesting to me. Um, unless you're like Cracker or something, you know. But I, so when we done the take, I, I created Freddie Jackson, then I created his wife, then I created a story for them. And he was such a big character, you know. He was such, you know, such a great character to write. And I quite like writing the big, powerful characters, you know. And, the big powerful world that they live in and how it can turn bad and how it can all fall out of bed for you. Do, do you think there's um, an overriding kind of sense of morality to the books then? Because obviously some of the criminals do get away with it. But well, mm, they do in real life. <laughs> but, I mean, not all my, my books don't always have a happy ending, which is real life. Oftentimes my books don't have a happy ending, although I did give one of my characters, Susan Dawson, a happy ending because I thought she'd suffered enough. <laughs> and I really liked Susan, so I did give her a happy ending. But oftentimes in life, life doesn't always have a happy ending. Sometimes it just resolves itself and you go on from there. And I think, for me, I, I like the realism of that. I mean, because, I mean, I, in my own books, I don't always have happy endings either, and I feel incredible mm. guilt. Do you ever feel that towards you? Because you've obviously come through with them, and you feel guilt for what you put them through in the Sometimes, end. Sometimes, um, because I think you live with these people for so long. I mean, I always say I'm the luckiest woman in the world, because I'm with people I want to be with all day, and if they get on my nerves, I can kill them. <laughs> and there's so few people who can say that. Um, and sometimes you do feel bad, you know, especially when you're writing a very, very harrowing book, you know, especially like Two Women. Yeah. And I was in Belmarsh oh, a few years ago now, and one of the young men in there, a young Irish guy, he was in there for life, and he come up and he said to me, I, I would never have read a book called Two Women, Martina, you know, Two Women, the title, and everything. He said, but when I read it, I felt like he was looking in my mum's window. It was us growing up. And when you read Two Women, it's such a... It's such a brutal book about a woman who kills her husband because he's battered her for so long. And, you know, if your children are growing up in that environment, what chance have they got? Yeah. And, of course, the twist in the book is that she didn't kill him, the daughter did. She took, it, she took the rap for the daughter. But there are many more twists than that. You should still read it. Yeah. Yeah. She, hit him, <laughs> she hit him 152 times with a claw hammer. And, it's not, and that's why the judge gave her so long. But you don't realise till the end that she had to do that to get rid of her daughter's DNA. <laughs> I like the way you gleam up when you say hit him 152 times with a claw yeah, hammer. And it's just the eyes going. It's took a, took me a while scared. to come up with that amount. <laughs> Practice. I mean, I really liked Susan Dalston. And it was really sad to me that someone you know, would cut, sit there and say, that was my life. I felt like you were looking in the window, and that's a sad thing. Yeah, it's... I mean, this is the books. You, you mentioned there the 152 times of the claw hammer, all the rest of it. And in this book in particular, there is one scene involving acid. I won't go into detail about it, <laughs> but I uh, had to go for a little walk around my office in the middle of reading it, <laughs> yeah. um, which, is, which is a good thing. D is, there, is there a point where you ever wonder about the, the violence that you do talk about, whether no, it's too much for you? Or? 
Mm-hmm. Oftentimes, I'll read back a chapter. I'll read back the chapter the next day, you know, whatever work I've done the day before, I'll read back the next day. And sometimes I'm shocked. <laughs> but you're so into the story, you should notice this is yeah. normal for you. You get so into the story that you just... You, you go where the story goes, and sometimes you can't hold back. You're in a, I'm, I often deal with a very vicious world, mm-hmm. you know, so, you know, you're dealing with vicious people. Yeah. Uh, have you had, I mean, I do you... I love their mums. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love Does, their mums, though. <laughs> is that what lets them off, that, yeah? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're saving grace, isn't it? They all love their mum. <laughs> Has there been any that's provoked a reader reaction, particularly? Because I know that Stephen King... Do you know the really, like really... Oh, Steve does, I know, but... Yeah. Do you know the really strange thing? I get sort of women come on books and say to me, where can I get a Michael Ryan? And I say, he's a six foot four homosexual. He wouldn't want you anyway. <laughs> or, where, you know, where can I get one of your male characters? You know, so I think there is a, a, a small part of women that likes the bad boys. Mm-hmm. You know, like, always like a bad... Look at him, he's nodding his head there. <laughs> <laughs> We've got one they in the audience. the bad boys, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean... As I say, it's, it's, it's all certainly gang lines. And what's really good about this one is it moves forward in the decades so well. Yeah. So you start off sort of early on and you move up through the years. Yeah. And to you, was it important to portray the kind of changes that happen in the, the underworld as well? Because I think the villains oh, yeah. that are around change so completely. And Everything Cantle. changed. Well, this craze and the Richardson's went around in the 60s, then you had the 70s, and then drugs arrived in big time. And that's when it all really changed because there's so much money. And then you had the Yardies turned up, everyone turned up, the Russians have turned up in the last 10 years. And you know, these, these are different cultures with completely different ways of looking at things. People, I mean, people annoy me, they go, oh, when the craze were in the East End, you know, no one got burgled. And my mum used to say, we had nothing to nick. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure it was the same here. People left their doors open, what are you gonna nick? A loaf of wonder loaf, do you know what I mean? But the, as the years have gone on, people have got televisions, you've, you know, People were doing much better with that. And you have to allow for that in books, that you know, every era brings a different you know, mm-hmm. sunset of problems. So you were looking at, by the 80s, the drug scene was so big with ease and everything that was going on. And there's a lot of money there. And where there's a lot of money there, you're going to have a lot of entrepreneurs and a lot of people who want that money. Yeah. A, an interesting word entrepreneurs use, but I think probably from their point of view, it's, that's what it is. So it's, I mean, it's, it's one of those things. Um, what I was going to ask, though, about, about this change and stuff, do you think that the villains now, because I, I assume you still do a bit of research into how the world mm-hmm. is, is yeah, now from, course, yeah. now you're separate from it, do you think they are any worse than they used to be? I mean, I know... I think, mm-hmm. to be honest with you, any kind of crime, whether it's murder, whether it's serial killers, whatever it is, one thing I have noticed is, thanks to the internet, you hear more. I'm not so sure there's more crime now, or you just hear about it more. Do you remember 9-11? I was in a supermarket at 9-11 and everyone was talking, it was so shocking, you know, everybody was so shocked. There was this really tiny little old lady and she went, she went, thank you, that's my son. (laughs) It's my baby. (laughs) And she went, she went, my husband, I lost my husband in the Second World War. She said, but I didn't know for weeks and weeks. She said, because you couldn't watch the war on television then. And it's true. We now watch war on television every night before we have that dinner. You know, so I don't know if there is so much more crime or if you just hear more about it. If you look at the, new, the newspapers now, it has to be a particularly brutal murder to hit the front page. 50 years ago, any murder was murder, murder, read all about it. Do you? So I, I don't know really, you know, and also a lot of crime went unreported, rape, you know, paedophiles, things like that. People would beat the man up and he'd just go along to the next town and start the whole thing again because people were ashamed to admit it happened to them or their children. Do you, you know, male rape is a really big problem at the moment. It's a really big problem these days, but very few men admit that it's happened to them. So I often wonder, you know, if there is more crime or if we hear more about it. You know, because don't forget, we hear about crime in America, we hear about crime in Syria. You know, 25, 30 years ago, it took us weeks before we knew what was happening in Syria. You know, so you have to wonder, is it just because we, it's all at the touch of a button? And also, you know, a lot of the news now has to be really exciting news. Yes. So you're getting all the, the worst sort of that you can get really is what, what people are reporting. I mean, Sky News is on 24 hours a day, BBC News is on 24 hours a day. 
they've got to tell you something. <laughs> You know? I always watch those 24-hour news things and they always seem to be yeah. just killing time and waiting Fox, outside somebody's house. Fox says. News is my one. I'll fall asleep to Fox News. America has the best serial killers, be fair. I mean, we just can't compete. Do you know what I mean? And did you see that the other day on Twitter? You know, um, what's his name? Donald Trump. Oh, yeah. Some English prankster tweeted him a picture of Rose West and her husband and said, this is my mum and dad, and they absolutely loved you, and you were such a Benny, put it on. <laughs> he actually put it on his Twitter page, yeah. <laughs> so I'm assuming they don't get as much of our news as we get there. <laughs> It was. I think that they've yeah. started a thing now. They had uh, the country yeah. singer Billy Ray Cyrus oh, tweeted yeah. a picture of Jimmy Savile as somebody's uncle. Um, yeah. So mm. yeah, exactly. That was that was my yeah. reaction. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's interesting to me that you you're known for your crime writing and you're yeah. very well known for that. But obviously we've discussed that you started off writing your romance novels um, mm. as much as you could in things. And I was just wondering because. I don't think you, you have read almost everything. I don't think you just take your influence from crime novels, do you? No, yeah. I, I read everything and anything that's going. I read every book. I read, I read over 100 books in the summer. My trouble is I can often, because I read so many, two, I can read two books a week when I write my own books. Yeah. If I'm, I've got a house abroad and I, I can read a book a day out there, I read really, really fast. And I read everybody and anybody. Mm-hmm. And sometimes I know the storyline, but I can't think <laughs> what the book is. <laughs> but I, for me, reading has been my biggest pleasure all my life. Mm-hmm. Was that something that kept you, because you were talking earlier about education and things mm. like that as well, was that something that was self-taught for you then, given yeah. where you came from? Yes. My nanny Lachlan was Irish. My mum and dad were Irish, Dublin and Cork. Um, and my nanny Lachlan came for the weekend and stayed for over 11 years, which really done my dad's head in, good to that. And she taught me and my brother, to, I'm the youngest of five, and my older brother and sister's like 18, 20 years old, and me and my brother Tony, there's two years, one day between us, and my mum had two children in her change. <laughs> yeah, well, not a happy bunny, that one, I'll tell you. But, um, and my nanny Lachlan lived with us, and she taught us to read, you know, read and write our names before I went to school. So I think that's really, really important to catch children as young as possible mm-hmm. yeah. and get them, you know, the love of reading. You know, so many times kids get to a stage with reading where they have to read. It's about giving them stuff they want to read as opposed to what they have to read at school. Because you're incredibly involved with, because you talked about your prison work and stuff, and there's uh, something else you've been involved in recently. Yes, the reading agencies learning at work. Yes, yeah, six things. book so, challenge. Yeah, yeah we got, we, this morning I've been at the NHS Health Trust. We've done two events there for people, you know. A lot of people haven't read a book since they were at school. Other people are really big readers and, you know, enjoy the reading. Uh, our, our job really is to get people back picking up a book for pleasure because I think it's the greatest mm-hmm. pleasure in the world. Yeah. Was there something, did you seek them or did they come and seek no, you? No, they out? came yeah. for me, yeah. 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 They came <laughs> to get me. Because, <laughs> uh, I mean, this is, but you're also, you've, you've got your books, you've got mm-hmm. all the rest of what we've talked about, but you've also, if, if anyone's got a subscription to Sky, there have been a couple of fantastic dramas yeah. based on your books. Now, Am I right? You're really deeply involved because most writers I know aren't, but you're we're very executive deeply involved. Produce them. I have a film company and a television company, mm-hmm. um, and we executive produce. We we we're in with the casting and script editing. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I have quite. We, we I'm very very lucky in that respect. I work with a lady called Lavinia Warner. I've done four television series with her, and she done Tenko. Do you remember Tenko years ago? And Tenka was the first program ever on British te- any television, actually, in the world, where it was about women, it wasn't about men. And so Vin's like, you know, she loves the powerful. So we've done Dangerous Lady, then we've done The Jump, and more recently we've done The Take and The Runaway for Sky. And I mean, how lucky were we? We had, we got sort of Tom Hardy, just before Tom went into the strategy. I don't think he'd do the next one, somehow. But, and we got, you know, sort of, really, really great actors and actresses in, and they made it fantastic. Alan Cummings took six weeks off, or eight, two months off with The Good Wife, he just got an Emmy, and to, to play Desiree, because, you know, he's a lovely, I mean, he's a lovely Scottish boy, but he's also a very open homosexual, isn't he? You know, and he, he's, I mean, he was on a, one of the television programmes, morning programmes, he said, how lucky am I, you know? The main character is a, is a transvestite homosexual who's the most normal person in it. And he loved the whole concept. He'd done all his own makeup as well and his own singing. 
his own hair. Yeah. But also, I love the fact that Desiree was, you know, Kathy's mum and her dad. You know, and you, we, now the Americans use the term blended families, didn't they? I think it's quite a nice term, you know, blended families, because there's so many families who are intermarrying, you know, divorced and marrying. And I love the whole concept that she had Desiree, mm -hmm. and he was her mum and her dad, and everything that she could ever want. I mean, you, they've been great adaptations, but you're, I think you mentioned there you're writing the script for Lady Killers at the moment. Mm. Um, and how difficult is it for you changing forms in that kind of way? Because you've, you've written this book already, and now mm. you've got to create a TV show which is necessarily well, going actually, to be different. Well, actually, Lady Killer, mm -hmm. the book, is going to be a feature film. Mm. Yeah, it's going to be a feature film. And hopefully, please God, we've got Rachel Wise to play the lead, you know, for Kate. Um, and we've got a really great cast. Because oftentimes, you can't get the cast you want because... It's not that they don't want to do it, it's that they're filming something else. So, you know, it depends when you're on, you know, you're on production things. So, yeah, and I'll script edit that. I had the scripts for um, a few weeks ago and they were fabulous. Mm -hmm. Got a really great script, script guy on it, you know, and everything's mm -hmm. fabulous. Um, and we're doing it, I'm doing it with a friend of mine called Debbie Gray, who's just done a film called Northern Soul, which is out soon. I don't know if she's talking in the Telegraph Saturday, they've done a big write up. We went to the premiere last week and it is fabulous. Um, I'm about to, because it's that time of the evening, ladies and gentlemen, and I can see, I can see some of them scaring, where I'm going to turn over, because my questions are daft, but I'm going to turn over to you in a second. <laughs> but to give you a bit of time to do that, um, we're going to take a roving mic out as well. Um, yeah. so it's going to be like because, the Jeremy yep, Carl show. It's going to be, yeah. <laughs> if you have family problems, Martina will help. Um, but Jeremy Carl, right? Before we do that, to give them just a moment to prepare, um, and to give me time to prepare to do a challenge, and I can run amongst them, um, I have to ask, as a former bookseller, if you could recommend just one classic book you think has stayed with you and one thing you've read recently that you've really book loved. book that stayed with me all my life was A.J. Cronin's Hatter's Castle. I remember when I was a kid, I got it at Jumble Sale and I would read anything and everything you could get your hands on. And I can remember reading it and I've, listen, I've got three first editions of this book. One I bought myself, one my publishers bought me and one I got off Lavinia Warner because it is my greatest book of all time. I don't know if anybody's read it. Has anyone read it? Oh, it's, it's a great, big, powerful, melodramatic story, and it's, it's a Scottish story. And people look down on A.J. Cronin because he'd done sort of um, Dr. Finley's case book and things like that. But this book really, really affected me when I was a very young girl because it's so powerful, and it's got the Taybridge disaster. I mean, you name it in this book. And there's one scene when his wife's dying and she's, like, crucified on the bed, and I can remember crying my eyes out. It was just such a powerful, powerful story. And he thought he was better than everybody around him. He made hats, you know, but he was a big, powerful man and who should have been on the land, really. And he loved the fact that, you know, he had his shop. I mean, I would say, I, one book I always say to everyone, you must read this book in your life at some point. And I never knew that the, the, the expression, mad as a hatter, came from the glue. <laughs> and they'd be gluing hats all day. And then, of course, I was high as a kite. So that's where Mad as a Hat comes from. But it's just a powerful, powerful book. I knew I should have gone into haberdashery. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to be honest, I think I wish I had and all something. <laughs> but um, I think for a contemporary book at the moment, there's just so many. I mean, I've read so many over the summer. Um, I can't, I couldn't, I couldn't say that any one book I'd say you have to get, do you know what I mean? Because they were all so good, all powerful, powerful books. I will just say this, on behalf of Waterstones, the last time Martina came to Dundee and I interviewed her, she mentioned A.J. Cronin. Yeah. The sales of that book flew yeah, up, yeah. so we're expecting to see a massive, because her recommendation Fantastic, fantastic author, yeah. really fantastic author, <laughs> I've got to say that. And at the moment, I'm reading Muriel Spark, actually, mm -hmm. um, The Ballad of Peck I read it when I was young, and I'm reading it now for Radio 4. Yeah, mm -hmm. so, yeah, another fan. But I was always a Palmer Miss Jean Brodie girl myself, you know. <laughs> the creme de la creme. No, okay. <laughs> and I shall, <coughs> ladies and gentlemen, if anyone does have any questions, please, reach, as you can see, Martina is not as scary as you might think she is. Thank <laughs> you. And I can see a hand over there, and I shall <coughs> run over with the microphone. This is the point where I get my exercise for the week, so. Um. Thank you. Um, quite a few writers have started to write for teens, Cathy Reich, uh, Chris Ryan, John Grisham. Have you ever thought of doing a series, a, a, t 
teen series of yours? No, no, no. Do you know, sometimes it really shocks me because I'll be doing a signing somewhere and someone will say, my daughter passed her GCSE in English because of you. Because they have to pick a contemporary book and an old book and they pick my books, yeah. But I couldn't see me writing for teens. No, no. No, I'd like to, but I just think I might get in trouble or something. You know? <laughs> not with them. <laughs> no, not with them, but with the parents. Yeah. And oh, I can see your hand. Mm. That was easy. <laughs> Hi, Martina. Nice Hi, to yeah. you. Um, I, I'm doing writing as a hobby, and yeah. I've always wondered that how do you overcome um, writer's block and what's your general routine to write a book? I write um, through the night. I've always written through the night, and because years, you know, years ago, it's really strange because I used to write through the night, and then I used to hear the milkman, you know, and I think, oh, it's getting really late, but of course, we haven't got no milkmans left, have we? So now, well, I'm, now I've got chickens, I wave my cockerel to kick off, and I think, oh, I better go in. But I prefer through the night for the simple reason there's no phones, there's nothing, it's just silent, you know? Yeah. And then, you know, when you hear the world start moving around you, I start to wind down, yeah. you know, but I. Personally, for me, I would say to you with writer's block, have a couple of projects on the go. And if you're looking at the blank screen and you don't know where to go, start on something else, because that's what I do. Okay. And then I think, oh, well, I've got that as well, so start on that and take your mind as far away from it as possible, because sometimes you can overthink. Mm -hmm. Have you ever had a really big problem and you keep thinking about it, then you overthink it, don't you? Yeah. And that's the same with writing a book. Thank you. Yeah, so just keep at it and just keep going. And go as far away from it as go shopping. At the avenue, <laughs> have a lovely, have a lovely coffee, and sit down and think about anything else but what you're doing. Okay. And then later on, you know, things come to you, don't they? And that, that's how I do it. That's that works best for me. That's great. Thank Good you. luck. Thank you very much. And get the writer's night nice year book. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you. And oh, I can see a hand close by. Yes, you were saying that you um, you had characters in mind. Is it normally you think of the characters? I've got a few questions for you, by the way. That's just one okay. <laughs> You think that way, or do you have a story? Do you have the ending in mind? It or all does depends. The ending come late? Honestly, it really depends. Sometimes you get a character and you base the book around the character. Yeah. Other times you have the story. You know, have a story in your mind, and uh -huh. then you create the characters to work with the story. Yeah. My books always have a beginning, a middle, and an end, but it always changes as you're writing. You know, when you're writing a letter or an email, and you think, you know, you write to someone and you tell them something, then you think, oh, that happened. And oh, someone told me that the other day, and this happened, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, doesn't it? Mm. You know what I'm saying? I know you do. Yeah. And that's what happens with, with a book. Yeah. No, you I know, other characters arrive and other, other storylines arrive. Yeah, I, I was wondering if you said you were expelled from school a few times. Mm. Do you think that was because the schools were boring? And, you know, a corollary to that is that you have got a compulsion to write. Do you think it was sort of in your blood, in your DNA? That, I, I don't know. Too? I think for me, I was just, I wasn't a very good child, I don't think, you know. I did find the schools boring. Well, at the convent, I found the regime really boring. I just found it really, really boring, you know. Um, and I don't know what to say, really, because if there's anyone here who should be going to school or something, I'm always be worried about that. But I just hated the whole concept of school. I just never liked it. Um, and I really regret, more than anything, that I never took the opportunity. We've got the best education system in the world, and it's free. And that's what I'm saying. Some people come from an environment where you're not encouraged to take up education, you know? And unfortunately, I think that's what happened with me. But I've, I've had, you know, I always say, you know, go, you know, you must get to go, you must get an education. Education, you can do anything, you know? <laughs> Thank so, you. Um, I thought I saw a hand. Yes, I did. There we are. It's quite good. This is, this is exercise coming all the way over here. There we go. You've obviously been an inspiration to many people, given your background and where you've come. You know where you've come from and where you've gotten to. But who has been inspiring for you? Who do you really look up to? You know, at the perfect dinner party, who'd be sat at your table with you? Well, do you know, in one of my books, I had one of my my female characters used to dream of her perfect dinner party. You know, who she'd have. I think for me, I'd probably have um, Harvey Keitel. <laughs> <laughs> You'd have to have even Jack Nicholson, wouldn't you? Just to look at him, if they never said nothing. Um, and I think it's so many interesting people in the world, you know, sort of... I met Bill Clinton a few years ago. I went to his, his wife's launch party. 
And I didn't find him as exciting as I thought I would. So I probably would stick with people I thought were quite exciting. I'd sit interviewed properly. <laughs> but I mean, it's, you know, so many people in the world you'd love, to, you know, you'd really love to meet and sit down and talk to, you know. John Barrowman would probably be one. Because I think he's very sexy and I'm, you know, and I think he likes women as much as he likes men. <laughs> um, and also think people from history, you know, sort of someone like, you know, Wellington or someone or, you know, you know, people from history and things like that, I think be really interested. And also, I would love to have had someone like Joni Mitchell or someone. Yeah, you know, I'm really old to like Elvis. You know, and have a really good eclectic mix of people and just get their opinion on things, yeah. Sounds like a blast. <laughs> yeah, I know. Shame it's never going to happen, really. <laughs> Nobody tell Martina John Barrowman went to school just up the road. <laughs> oh, I'm in the next cab. <laughs> Um, do we have another hand? Did I see one moving around somewhere? Or no? Oh yes, I thought I, th I thought I could see somebody moving. There we are. <laughs> Hiya. Um, sometimes I, I, when I'm, I read your books, I actually like after I've read them, I'm like, oh, I have to take a couple <laughs> of weeks away before I could read another one. Yeah. You know how do you cope with writing and? and Starting all over again. It is. It's hard. Some, like sometimes I read my books back, you know, sort of read the chapters back. I'm quite shocked to myself. And so I do tend to have a bit of time between the books because sometimes they can be very harrowing, you know, and they can be very, it takes a lot out of you. Um, but then the book's gone and I write the end. I have the biggest whiskey you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> right? And a cigarette, I think, right, that's gone. And I, when I finally send it to my publishers, I just don't think about it anymore. But the really strange thing is, just about before the f last few chapters, when I do the f final rewrites, I do two or three, sometimes four rewrites, I'm already thinking about the next book. And I think that's how, you, that's how authors, you know, how we cope with it. You've already got new characters coming, because you know these characters so well. By now, you know, you've written them for so long. And then I sort of get the next book starts coming into mind and storylines and strands. And that's what we say to people, you know, I was to down the prisons. You know, if you want to write, especially you, because I know you do, go, you know, when you get a scenario in your head or you're laying in bed or you're at work or you're, you're having a coffee or something, always keep a pen and paper and write that scenario down. Or sometimes I talk to people and they will come out with a really, really great one line or on a day that I've never heard before. And then you can build a whole chapter around that. Do you, you know, so, but for me really, I'm so glad to see the back of the book by the end of it, because I've written it so many times. And when I do the end, it's the greatest feeling in the world. But by then you're already thinking about the next book, you know, and you've already got your new characters. Maybe, I don't know, maybe that's sort of um, nature's way of saying, let that, you know, go and, and start the next thing. Thank you. Do we have one more? I think we've got time for one more. If anyone's hands have I missed? No. Well, if, if you haven't, I, I do have one more myself, actually. Um, He's you've got one in reserve. I've got, yeah, <laughs> I've got one in reserve, that's it. Yeah. Uh, no, it's, um, I don't know what that voice was, by the way. Um, <laughs> but I was going to ask, because you've written lots and lots of books. Yeah. Um, quite a few now, this is the latest one obviously, but was there, it's kind of a double-edged sword, was there one that was particularly difficult for you to write, other than probably the first one, and is there one that you feel particularly proud of above all the others for having completed? I think the hardest one to write, um, I'd say it was probably two women, or maybe Faceless, you know? Faceless was very, very hard to write. I've done a lot of research for that. Um, and it's funny because I put in the front of Faithless about one of the women, you know, the prostitutes in London that I used to deal with, and she just disappeared off the face of the earth. And I finally found her, she died of AIDS, and we'd had this big, huge argument because she, and she knew she was HIV, and if people still wanted to sleep with her about a condom, she did. And I said, well, how can you do that? How can you, you know, but I think by then, her attitude was, well, someone gave it to me, do you? And the really strange thing is, she had all her sons, and I met one of her sons in, in, in London, he was on the door of a club in London, and he said, my mum loved you, and I felt really terrible. And so that was a very hard book to write, and she was the one who said to me about, look round your supermarket, 
You know, if you see women with loads of bruises up their shins, it's getting in and out of lorries. And I mean, when would that have occurred to me? It never occurred to me. I'd just assume they fell down the stairs or something. So she gave me so much insight into that world, you know, and it was fabulous. Now, I'm very lucky. I have a great network of people who've always helped me, you know, with the books and make them factual and things like that. I think my favourite... I don't know if it's favourite book. I think of all, would probably always have to be Dangerous Lady for the simple reason, you know, it was a book that sort of launched me and launched my career. And I, lo I loved Maura Ryan. Maura Ryan was a great character to write. And I still, I still like Maura, you know. And do, do you think since then that you've, you've learned a lot more about, do you, do you feel it's an easier process for you to create? I don't think now? writing's yeah. ever going to be an easy yeah. process. You should know that. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's never going to be an easy process. And you know, your first book is the best book you'll ever write because you can take 25 years. <laughs> it's the second book that's a hard one because they want it to be in nine months. So, and it is a great process and I love the fact I got up every morning for years and went to jobs I hated to pay the bills. I love the fact that I can now have a job that I absolutely love, you know, and I, I think that's such an important thing in life is to love what you do, and I love what I do. And it shows in the writing. It really, I, I think, so. yeah, it does. It, they're, they're, it's a fantastic book, the new book, The Good Life. It is really good. I obviously read it before coming in, hence why I had some questions. Um, and I absolutely loved it. You will all love it too. You should all buy multiple copies, <laughs> um, as always. Not just to support Martina, but also the, the lovely people at Waterstone. So I you paid them a fortune to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I know the check hasn't cleared. <laughs> but and it won't. <laughs> But ladies and gentlemen, she is absolutely fantastic. She will sign your books. I, I believe you will sign the books oh, if, if they buy them. Yeah, um, we would ask you just to cue from that side. But ladies and gentlemen, in the meantime, the absolutely marvellous Martina Thank Cole. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Brilliant. She's absolutely amazing. So, and I, mm -hmm. I couldn't believe the way she was with it. She's just so good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've had a fantastic night, actually. Well, I'm quite surprised as well. Enjoyed it more than I thought I would. You get to meet new people. You get to meet the author who's inspired you to do your own writing as well. Um, it's just reading really good stories. It's always counted for me. And Martina writes just really wonderful, dark and gripping stories. And I thought it was a great chance. I didn't think I'd get to meet her. It's lovely. Get a yeah. signed book, one for my sister. I didn't actually realise she'd be chatting. I actually just thought we'd be buying the book and she'd be signing it. So no, it's been great. Very insightful. I've read every single book up since uh, her new one, which is right here. The Good Life being released today, the six and hopefully it's going to be a killer. Great, it's a nice yeah, surprise. Yeah, I, a nice I will. <laughs> nice cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs>